Melissa comes from 20 plus years in enterprise ad tech sales and marketing. And she also works as a professional improviser at Unexpected Productions in Seattle. As a storyteller, she regularly appears on the Moth Story Slams, Seattle's Fresh Ground Stories, Ignite Seattle, Nami's Brain Power Chronicles, The Risk, and her stories have been heard on NPR and coming to PBS. She also has a book coming out for executive leader, leaders to become more emotionally connected in January 2023 called The Storyteller's Mind Movie. Welcome, Melissa Reeves. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Atu. I'm thrilled to be here. First, I would like to ask, just out of curiosity, what is a professional storyteller actually doing? <laughs> well, yes. So I do step out on stages, like you mentioned, and I share personal stories. So oftentimes, like if you are listening to The Moth, which is about 20, 25 years old, they're known as the granddaddy of storytelling shows. And the storytellers are given a theme or word, you know, like surprises, like we saw last night. And we prepare a five to six minute personal stories, however we want to unpack the theme that they have. And mm -hmm. so I will go to work, I will find personal moments in my life, and then I will construct a story that will hopefully have a really nice art, rich characters, dialogue. My whole goal is that when I'm telling story, that it is a mind movie, that you're just sucked up into it because... I'm being very vivid with the way I use senses and whatnot. Starting I mean, does mind, I'd like to ask about mind movie. Does it mean that somebody who listens to the story is able to see the story in his mind like a movie? Is that the word? Exactly. The meaning of word? Exactly. Because a Got lot it. of people tell you stories. Everyone tells stories. But what I'm, what I'm trying to bring to the world is create mind movie makers. And that takes technique. So I, I coach that all day long. Got it. I'd like to ask you then, uh, what inspired you to become a storyteller? How, how you became professionally one? Could you elaborate your background a bit? Well, it was it was a few years ago, and I had actually brutally been fired. <laughs> it, it wasn't fun. It was not fun. And uh, at the same time, my one of my children was having some um, mental health issues, uh, OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder, which I also had when I was a kid. So it was pretty serious and I had to be at, at this, this counseling with her four days a week for three hours a day. And then at night we would do two hours of in, intensive, um, uh, uh, therapy, excuse me, therapy. And it was, it was, it was intense. And so I was finding it really hard to even concentrate on the job interviews. I was sick of the job that I was doing. I, I hated it anymore. And I wasn't going to be able to do these high ticket salary jobs that required me to be on airplanes. I was pretty scared. Like, how am I going to What, gonna jobs, what mm -hmm. jobs were you doing that time, which were high I was ticket? coming to the end of my ad tech and marketing technology sales. I had been doing it since about 2000. And 2005, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And I, my corporate career actually went pretty high as far as being in sales for this type of technology. But you could tell that I was getting sick of it because when we first started, it was the shiny penny. It was so much fun. Everyone was like, what's this behavioral targeting? We're like, we know what they like and we'll follow them all around the web. It's great. Um, but by 2017, 2018, everyone knew what it was and everyone was just quibbling over pennies on every click through rate. And you could tell in my job interviews that I just didn't care. <laughs> I just was like, they're like, so what was your most, you know, in, intensive, uh, sales success? I'm like, eh, whatever. Um, I guess Expedia, I guess. <laughs> and that's when I knew I was like, maybe, maybe my, my passion and my career are starting to wind down. So then when I got let go, it was almost as if the universe was like saying, yeah, you're miserable and you got to go find something that brings you joy. So one day I was licking my wounds and really sad when I just got this gut instinct to get a notebook, write down everything that I do enjoy about work. Cause I love to work, but I just was tired. So I just started writing this list of things that I bring to the table when I show up. And it was things like, um, I'm a great communicator. I love sales. I enjoy marketing. I love helping people with their audience um, and how they talk to them. And and I'm good at improv. And I and I know that case studies are really important in enterprise sales. And they're told usually pretty bad. I would like to help people do that. And next thing you know, as I'm writing this list and I'm writing this list, it's starting to come to me as to what I was going to do. 
I honestly didn't believe it would work. I wasn't sure. Like, would executives hire me to teach them how to storytell in business? I don't know. So I tried and I went out and I got my first client who was a friend of mine who knew he'd seen me on stage, seen me acting. And he was an executive going in for a very, very big pitch, like huge with Andreessen Horowitz for his, his startup. Mm-hmm. And he called me up and he said, my presentation is amazing, but it has no heart. What do I do? It has nothing. So he hired me and I worked with him to find these case studies, which I was starting to realize were case stories. And we found, we found the people that he helped because his technology essentially helped anyone in a corporate, um, that had the option to use their service that may have been drowning under financial debt. You know, it could have been a bad divorce or healthcare or something. And they're struggling. I found these amazing stories, these, these like hard string, like you're going to cry when you hear this story. They come in as the hero. It works really well. He placed those strategically into his pitch deck. And he would show a chart and then he would tell us, or he'd tell a story, then he'd show the chart to back it up. Then he'd tell a story to do, and then to get the chart. He walked out with $35 million in his series A after he did that presentation. And it was very exciting. And that's when I realized, yeah, people can hire me and I can do something to help them because stories are everywhere, but let me help them tell them more dramatically, more impactfully. And that's, that's how it got going. And it just kept going. And like, I've been doing it solidly for four years now. Um, and it's only growing. <laughs> and, uh, how do you typically work with corporate clients? Like, how does it look like when, when somebody works with a professional storyteller? Yes. Well, there's a few ways actually. So the most common way that I start usually is that I, I, I will start working with a a C-suite person. You know, it could be the CEO, the founder going into their pitch deck and they see me find their story that they, that I can, um, that I can put into their pitch deck. And so instead of the problem and the solution, both being graph slides, it's actually, we show people having the problem. We create the story and then they come as the hero. So that's usually the first entree into that level. Um, but I have been also working with CFOs and CIOs and they are really like, I love these types of clients because they're self-reflective. They're looking at their own skill set saying, I could be better. Like I, I know I'm flat. Like most of my day I'm in these charts because I'm a CFO and I'm just the person that's going to flash that big old P and L line to everybody and let you know how I'm doing it. When I know I could be more captivating because money's emotional. Money, money is like, we're either excited or we're scared we don't have it. So how do I tell stories as I'm walking through the numbers that actually reflect what's going on with the financials? And it's been working. Clients are just like the, not only is it more fun for them to give their presentations because it's not just graphs, but it's really much more fun for their listeners too, right? They're like, they can remember the presentation more because you're not going to remember a pie chart. You're just not. You're not going to get emotionally charged by a pie chart. You're going to get emotionally charged by the story that backs up that pie chart. And so from there, I'll usually get another executive because they're like, do that, what you did to her, do that to me, (laughs) you know? But what's really, really, really the ultimate goal is to have me come in and teach a storytelling workshop to the people that they know are their core storytellers. And in a company, your core storytellers tend to be the C-suite, of course, um, your sales and your marketing teams, but also product and also um, biz- business development. And so many companies have these core stories, like their founder's story, their success stories, their greatest hits stories. And everyone, they have stories that people need to know. And so what I do is I teach them how I do what I do on stages and I transfer it over into the boardroom uh, situations. But then we record the stories in storyboards, which are basically little maps of the story so people can memorize them. And we put them into a story library. And the story library is now classifying all the different types of stories. So you might have C-suite leadership, case stories, uh, recruitment stories, product development, vision stories. And everyone can just go there, retrieve the story, learn how to tell it. And now what we're doing is we're infusing storytelling into the culture of the company. And that's pretty magnetic. What qualifies as a good storyteller, in your opinion? A lot of people, a lot of people in Europe say that all Americans are born 
into a culture of storytelling. And, and everybody here naturally in the States are good storytellers. Would you agree on that? No, I would not agree on that. <laughs> um, I'm, and I'm glad because they need me. Um, no, a lot of people. So there's a difference between, like I said, storytelling and then mind movie making. You know, that that's the difference. So most people, because I listen to people tell stories to me all day long and I'm watching for how they tell. And most people, we have not been taught this. This is not yet. Maybe it will change under my, my mission, but we're not taught storytelling in school. We don't have it. We, we learn how to write it, analyze it, read it, but to tell it, to tell it so that it's captivating, that should be taught. I think that should actually be taught in schools. And what what makes a great storyteller to me is that they don't meander, they don't use verbal junk, and they're very, very deliberate and vivid with the way they're going to introduce every scene in this story that they're telling you. Because this, the story in itself is usually made up of seven or eight scenes, and people don't really realize that. So my clients start to tell a story, and then I'm like, zoop, 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 zoop. I'm, I'm cutting out all the fat. I'm taking away the meandering and we are seeing their life in this lesson that they're learning go scene by scene and they know where they're going and they know that they need to introduce the characters. We need to see them, hear them, smell them, touch it, all of it. And that's using your senses. And so I talk a lot about this in the book. Um, I did not invent this. This is what many storytelling coaches would teach. But if you don't know it, then you're just sort of meandering around, kind of telling a story by default. And I want you to feel like you're more in control. Got it. Got it. What, what do you what? see as your long-term impact when you, when, you, when you go to corporates and train, and train executives to become better storytellers? What does it do uh, on a big picture, let's say, for humanity? Right. Well, we all go to work, right? Everyone gets up every day. They, it's Monday morning. Well, let's even back it up. It's Sunday night. How do you feel? about Monday morning coming. If you're excited, then things are probably going pretty well in the morale department at your company. You're doing something that's giving you joy and and that's great. I want all of that. But if you're getting up and you're kind of dreading it, then there might be a morale issue a little bit. And that I would always look at the leaders, right? Because I, there's that expression, the fish stinks at the head or the fish smells good at the head. And I learned that personally throughout my whole career when I've had various leaders change. You, the organization changes with them. And so by creating millions of global, amazing corporate or startup or any companies, storytellers, you are going to create pe people who are willing to be vulnerable, willing to share their wisdom, willing to be patient while you might be living a story together in your company's journey and being able to capture it so that it becomes a recorded piece of history through that story. And that's a lot more fun than just getting up, doing the job and going home, right? You said you're connecting to your people and storytelling is going to do that. It, it literally will emotionally connect people to you. So I think that so you, a positive impact across the world. So you want to put emotion back to corporates. Yeah. That <laughs> not the right way to put it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a beautiful uh, mission you got there. Uh, do you have a, um, Secret sauce for storytelling. How to do that? Well, or is, is it is it about just training vigorously different techniques and and yeah. is there is there something that should always be there in a yeah. good story? Well, my method. I I use some tenets from my improv background and I've tied that into the method. So my method, when you read the book or if you're working with me or taking the e course or any of the courses that we offer, uh, we call it Crow. So it's characters, relationships, objective, and where. And those four elements need to be in every single story. So when we're improvising and we're making it up on the fly, all the improvisers in the scene know that we have to be very clear with who the characters are. What's our relationship? You know, and you can do that. Unlike writing where you'd have to explain their relationship, you can do that with your voice. And you can do that the way you even say their name. Like I could be like, my friend Atu called me the other day. Or I could say, my friend Atu called me the other day. Just same lines said differently with a different tone already let the listener know how I feel about it too. And it's the first one, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I yes. appreciate it. Yeah. But you need to be, you need to be very vivid. And most people are very bland. You, if you can't see it, I'm going to give an example. Okay. I could say, uh, I'm driving 
I'm I'm driving in the car with my dad. Can you see it? Mm-hmm. Are you excited by this? I'm driving in the no. car with my dad. Okay, how about this? It's Sunday morning and the sky is just bright blue and I'm in my dad's red convertible and we are whizzing down this backcountry road listening to Rolling Stones. Wow, that's a different different thing altogether. Yeah. Yeah, honest, I see the point. And every layer that I have, you know, everything that I layered onto that is increasing the mind movie in your head. And so that's what I do as I teach people how to how to just keep layering it. But but then again, you don't have to go so far, right? Because they're going to make it up in their own heads, right? You might see a convertible that's, you know, a Mercedes. Another person might see a, a different type of convertible, right? Um, but I could have just said convertible and not told you the color. But by the top, but, but by the fact that I say it's a red convertible and it's my dad's car, what's that say about my dad? Is he, is he living high on life or is he having a midlife crisis? You know, the car could be very symbolic to what the relationship will further un- reveal itself with, as I keep telling the story. So mm-hmm. I could say, you know, and I'm driving, and I'm driving down this bumpy country road in my dad's beat up, dilapidated station wagon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. Oh, okay. So I want to ask, are these stories always uh, personal stories or uh, are you also working with stories of companies? Yes, 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 yes. Because the thing is, is that but what I've noticed, though, is that even when companies tell their story, they don't put people in them. You know, and mm-hmm. there's people that made that. There's people that are in those buildings. There's people that are that are striving to make this thing happen. And so I will approach a corporate brand story with more vigor in trying to highlight the energy of the people that are in there. Because if you were thinking about joining this company, don't you want to have a story that you feel like the people sound so cool? It, it just sounds like it has a great energy um, because buildings, buildings to me are no, no more exciting than a pie chart, right? It's, it's just a building <laughs> or, a logo, <laughs> yeah. or a logo. Mm-hmm. So, so could you give an example of, of uh, one story of, of some person and a, and a story of a company? Uh, I'd like to understand. Yeah. So, um, well, I could do like, I, let me give an example of like a case study that I would do yeah. here. Okay. So a case study, typically what I see is that they'll be like, here's our case study. And it will be a very busy slide. With a lot of charts, a lot of flow charts, lots of sentences to be read, and you can't even see it. And it'll just say something like the, the pharma client, the, fla- the XYZ pharma uh, client experienced a problem that was causing a negative uh, reaction on their bottom line. Our company came in and offered these sets of tools <laughs> and returned their numbers to a place of blank, blank percent. Mm-hmm. Those are seen all day long. Have you seen them? But, but that's what they are. Yeah, yeah. It's not interesting. It's not, and it's not exciting. And sales reps, I used to be one. We'd have to be. We tried to get it excited. We're like, look at that, two hundred and one percent return on investment because it was a financial vertical, and that was about as exciting as we got. Mm-hmm. Versus going in there and having your marketing team really with the salespeople find the people that were involved in that case study, and then say. And try to point it out. Now, sometimes you can't say the name, but you can at least put a person. You can, you know, you could say Marie, sir, the senior vice president of this company for 15 years has always complained that we just don't know where the data is. And if we don't know where the data is, then we are going to be wasting time manually trying to find these things. When our company got word of this, we stepped in and we were able to show her how we could funnel all of her data into one silo so that she was able to retrieve it easily with this dashboard. That is amazing, she says. Where can we continue to elevate our progress using more of your products? Long story short, our company is now working with this company for the last 10 years, blah, 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 blah. So I'm just kind of making this one up on the fly. But can you just see there's a difference where you can put it? Yeah. Yeah. You you put a character in the story. That's what the difference to me was. And that that seems amazing already. Um. I'd like to ask you about how how could the um, how could the impact uh, stories in companies be told? I, I, I'm sure that that uh, 
that's that's a very remarkable part of of company storytelling is to explain what the company does in the world what what's the mission the company is is on well, and if that's that's told with pie charts and whatever i think that that won't give the desired impact and that won't be good for anybody's branding yeah i mean one of my favorite quotes from simon senek is we don't buy what you do but why you do it and the why is really important. And you're right. The why is not going to be like, oh, this pie chart, this pie chart rocks. This is why we do this every single day. No, you need to have those human connections. Um, I think a good example is oftentimes, you know, I'll see nonprofits and they're doing like their gala event. And the executive director is standing in front of a pe- bunch of people who are probably slightly buzzed, holding paddles in their hands, ready to bid on Hawaiian vacations to raise money for that fund. And there is their moment. There's their moment to be able to inspire why everyone is in that room tonight to raise this money. And what do they do? More than more than once have I seen, they pull up a pie chart. And it's like, what are you doing? Instead, what you could do is like, let's say that they're fighting, you know, homelessness. Tell a story about one of the people that they that they saved that year. And really, you know, add some music underneath it while, while they're telling the story and show, show an image that people might see. So it could be like, when we first met Lenny, he was filthy. We couldn't even see his face because he had so much beard and his hair was out, you know, overgrown and starting to dreadlock. And he was at the bottom of the barrel. But when we got a hold of him, we helped him see that there could be light. And then like, they, when they, they would show the transformation of Lenny. Right. So that we're all rooting for Lenny. We're grateful for that organization for helping Lenny. Then you could show a chart, a chart and say, this chart represents how many Lennies are seriously in our community at this point in time. And this is why we are here and why we need your support so that we can help him and many people in similar situations that they didn't plan on to come, that they can have hope. So please raise your, raise your paddles, you know, and like get people excited because we're fighting now for, for, for a human being and a cause. Um, it's not a pie chart. Got it. Got it. I understand. Uh, what do you say storytelling helps in sales? You worked in sales before you started working in sales as I understood since you were 13 or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You told me the story. You told me the story where you were selling, uh, TV guides, was it? <laughs> yes. Do you want me to yeah. tell the story? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. It's an amazing story. You started early, right? Yes. So it's uh, it's true. I was actually six years old and I, and I was talking to my dad and I wanted him to give me something. I cannot remember what it was, but I wanted him to give me something. And he kept saying no. And I kept coming up with new reasons why he could come. I would like just find another angle, you know, like, do you want to have a child or do you want to have a happy child? You know, like I was really giving him the, the go. And he goes, Missy, you need to go into sales. I go, why? Because you don't hear no. You just don't hear no. So I'm 13 years old and I'm now in middle school and it's time to sell these magazine subscriptions to raise money for our school. And I am knocking on all the doors and I've, I've got my magazines and I got all of them. I got time. I got all the different magazines you need. I knock on the door of this man and it's about 5, 5.30 at night. And he's tired, clearly, when he answers the door. And the last thing he wants to see is me. He knows I'm going to pedal something at him and he is trying to close that door as fast as he can. And he's like, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm like, but, but, I, but, and then he shuts the door. And as I'm walking down the driveway, I'm like, that did not go as well as I think it could have. I mean, ah, ah. and then this light bulb goes on and I turn back around and I knock on his door again. And he opens, he goes, he, he, I'm like, hi. He's like, yeah. I go, you know what? I know you're, I know you're tired and you probably just want to sit down and, and have a drink and, 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 and watch some TV, right? He's like, that is exactly what I would like to do. So thank you. I'm like, but wait, don't you want to know what to watch? Look here. I've got TV guide and see here at 6 30, there's mutual Omaha's wild kingdom. Do you want to watch that? Oh, it looks good. looks like Jim's going to like chase some giraffes. <laughs> and he, he's just looking at this kid pitching him and I won't stop. And he ends up buying. And then so when I was like, daddy, you're right. I'm good at this. So of course I won the contest. I made all this money for my school. I did the same thing with my kid. I taught Quincy, my, my eldest kid at kindergartner who, you know, how the parents sometimes will just say, Hey, will you, uh, buy some wrapping paper for my kid's school? And they, they leave it in the break room and they want, they expect people to do it. And they do. I was like, no, 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 no. I will be teaching my child sales. And so Quincy has their, their, uh, brochure and I went in and I'm like, okay, 
So here are your solid papers. Here are your pattern papers. And here are sacks. Some people don't like to wrap papers. They like just have little sacks with like tissue. So you're going to want to ask these key questions. Are you a wrapper or a bagger? <laughs> and just start to learn. And all in between the book, you need to know where are your chocolates? Where are your picture frames? Like know how this catalog works because when you ask them questions, they'll tell you what they might want and then you can go right to it and show it to them. So I'm working at this TV station and filled with salespeople. And I say, listen, my kid's going to be selling, but she's going to be making some, some appointments with you. And sure enough, Quincy learns to make appointments. This is a kid that's like six or seven years old, makes appointments with everybody. They are lighting up. They can't wait to meet this kid. Quincy comes in, got the brochure. And before they go into the call, I said, listen, turn over the back cover. And on the back cover, there was this picture of this frog. And the frog, if you turn it upside down, actually held a key for you. So you could like have your house key and no one would know your house keys back there. And I said, if every frog that, that you sell, I'll pay you a $5 bonus, okay? But you can't tell them. You've got to sell it. So Quincy's sitting in the office of this woman named Cheryl, and she's got Cheryl up to at least $116 in, in wrapping paper. And I'm thinking, that's good. Call it a day. And as Cheryl is looking for their credit card, Quincy goes, Cheryl, do you have a house? I have two houses. Oh, well, you're going to need this. Flips the thing over, shows her the frogs, and says, and you can hide your key in it. Cheryl goes, I'll take two. Quincy mouths to me, you owe me $10. <laughs> well, Cheryl, it doesn't see a thing. And that's when I went, yep. But here's the thing. If you teach your kids sales early, they will be selling you for the rest of your life. And it gets really expensive. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I understand. So you'd say storytelling is extremely useful for sales. Oh, it's extremely useful. Um, and your salespeople, especially, you know, is really important. It's like if you're in a startup, you got to be able to paint the vision of your stories. It's not just the founders and the C-suite people that need to do it. The salespeople are going to continue that vision story. So they have to be able to, like when we were selling behavioral targeting, we were literally saying to people, imagine that they are now understanding your products and everywhere they go, they see it. They see it on their computer and then they, they're they on their phone and they're, they're logging onto Google and a, another ad will show up and a video on YouTube could show up because that's cross device targeting. And now you're able to reach your message with the very, with the frequency that they need, as well as not spend money on people who aren't interested in your products already. So people were really like, wow, like they could see it. You know, they could see someone at the computer and then they could see someone on their phone and then they could see someone watching videos. You know, like we have to be very, very clear with the mind movie that you're making, but it's, it's, it's really important. Got it. Do you see a trend coming and going in storytelling? Is it different than 20 years ago, 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you read books, you heard interviews from 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. So so is, is storytelling different these days or do the same rules apply uh, timelessly? I think that really great storytellers are already naturally, you know, giving us things to see, hear, smell, touch. Uh, because more storytelling shows like NPR's The Moth are on and it's becoming more, more common for people to listen, I think we naturally become better personally. I think we become better storytellers, but there's been amazing orators all over, you know, history. Um, and so, you know, I mean, there's been some, some that have, have created really horrible things in this world because they did some pretty negative vision stories for people. So we've got to be careful with how we use these powers. Um, but it's, yeah. So there, and you were asking me, um, you know, trends in storytelling. So mm -hmm. I teach, okay, I do personal storytelling, but I teach business storytelling. So I, I'm using my background to help executives because I have lived in those worlds with them. And I understand the, the nuances that go on within a huge corporation, how some departments work together and some hate each other and all that. I, I know how that works because I've lived it. But there's also, you know, social advocacy storytelling, you know, like the Lenny story that I just told you. Um, I've spoken about um, LGBTQT rights because I have a child that's trans. And I think that it's a responsibility from, from me to help those who are coming into that journey to be able to relax into it. Because personally, I thought that, the, that my journey with my child has been amazing. I have seen it be transformative. I've seen someone go from sadness to joy, to confidence. And so I tell stories 
I tell that story, but what I'm doing is I am entertaining you by telling you the story, but then I educate you. So I call it edutainment um, because I would give stats right in the middle of the story. I'll give stats about like how many people might be going through this or whatever, but it's all weaved into the narrative. So social advocacy is really big. Mental health storytelling has also become really big. Um, people, you know, who might have, an, you know, a, a passion to stop suicide, you know, because they know someone that that they lost from suicide. I have a few friends that, that are very passionate about that subject. And so they will they will share their own story as long as they're able to tell it. So that's something to also talk about is that you want to tell a story that is public consumptionable. Is that a word? The public consumption can take it. Yeah. And it's a story that you can tell without it hurting so bad. So we call that in the, in the little story industry, scar stories versus wound stories. And it's really important to know because most of the time when you've gone through some trauma, you need time to heal it. You need it. If you come on too, too soon, uh, you don't, you're not ready and it, and it can just drum up and even probably fuel the pain you're feeling. So you got to kind of get into a healing space before you can go back to visit some of those stories and only go back. If you really do think this, like when I had to go back and do my OCD story, it was a 10 minute memorized story for NAMI, which is the National mm -hmm. Alliance of Mental Illness. Um, it was tough sometimes it was tough to go back and have to visit that, but I had had enough time that I could. And then it became healthy for me to tell that story because I know that when someone hears it, I'm educating them and I'm showing them that like, it's not a disease that you just make fun of. Cause a lot of people will do this. They'll be like, Oh my God, my desk is so clean today. I'm so OCD. And I literally will say, are you? No, no, I was just kidding. I'm like, Oh, cause you know, like the reason why someone with OCD's desk is super clean is that if they don't have it clean, they're worried that something bad's going to happen. Like maybe they'll get hit by a car or they think a plane's going to crash, um, that uh, someone's going to get injured that they love. So they make sure that their stapler is exactly right there because their mind is telling them if they don't, it's all their fault. Mm -hmm. And so CT is like a mind prison. You don't have that, right? And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> But what I'm trying to do lovingly, though, is I'm putting in images in their heads. This is where I'm using my, my mind movie making skills all day long, right? To, to, to get, get, if I want to persuade someone to do something, I've got to have them see it too. I've got to have them mm -hmm. feel it. And if I can get them to feel it because I've done a good job showing it to them and letting them hear it, then we're on our way. And that's where I think storytelling, especially when you're building a company, will accelerate your sales process. It'll accelerate your partnerships coming forward, your alliances coming forward, because you're emotionally connecting to them with your storytelling skills. I see it all day long. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. Do you remember any any situation uh, or any case uh, throughout your career where you worked with somebody whose stories were really, really uh, bad? And uh, evidently uh, you, you made the story so emotional that it transformed everything. Well, I wouldn't say that their story was bad. It just wasn't told very vividly. And so <laughs> I do warn clients. I'm like, my team, we will be interrupting you when you're telling us a story because what we're doing is we're looking for the, the details, right? Sort of like what color was the car? Was it a convertible? What kind of road were you on? You know, like we're trying to find that bland stuff and trying to find how can we say that in your story so that you are more vivid. And it takes a little while, but when it all of a sudden, and it doesn't take, I'm going to take that back. It doesn't take that long, actually. It's a little while before they're like confident to do it, but they see it right away that when they go vivid, it's more fun than when they stay bland. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I understand. Uh, would you recommend uh, people who want to be good in storytelling to read a lot of books or watch a lot of movies? Does that help? Oh, for storytelling? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, well, it's interesting. I would say yes, because when you're watching movies, you know, like 
movies always have like the setup, right? Like the montage and things like that. And sometimes when I'm telling a story, we might be doing something kind of advanced where we need to tell the story, but we're going to do some some time travel in this story. We're going to go over like a series of five years or something. And we might start listing things really quickly, the, the accomplishments that we did in the, this one portion of the story. And that's like the montage in a movie, right? It's like all these activities happen. And then we did this and we did that. We did this and we move it really fast. So watching movies. And then when I'm talking to clients, I'll be like, this is our montage moment. Let's go. <laughs> and we'll start listing stuff really fast because when we're telling stories, part of the craft is we want to kind of vary um, the pace and the tones, uh, tonalities of your voice. And because what we're doing when we're, when we're telling a story is we are actually affecting the brain. So when you throw me a graph, my analytical brain goes in, it's the neocortex and I'm looking at the information, but I'm not emotional about it. It's the limbic brain system that actually is picking up on not just, not really even the words, but the, the emotional feeling. And when those two are working together, which they do, um, that's what determines behavior and behavior is when you start to make your decisions. And so it's really imperative that you have storytelling going on while you're showing these graphs to really lock it in. Um, same thing as when I'm telling a story, I will have also a visual for my clients. And usually it's just a single visual. Uh, I think I showed you that there's a crow in, um, in, in part of my teaching. And I joke, I'm like, I have a picture of this crow. And I go, I want you to always remember this crow. And what's it stand for? They're like character relationships, objective and where. And so <laughs> that's good. Right. And so now the teaching's getting in deeper because we're, we're locking it in. <laughs> uh, can, can you open this crow just a little bit more? Uh, I didn't get what you mean. The characters? Okay, yeah. Char character of relationship, something. Yes. Okay. So when you're introduced and when you're writing, when you're writing your stories, you're, anytime you're in it, first off, you're in it, or you're, if you're writing a business story, the main character's in it, like I used earlier, the, the senior vice president of that company. They meet someone along the way. So a good storyteller has to introduce the next character, right? They have to introduce them so that we can see them and we can understand their relationship. And I can show you their relationship by the way I might introduce them. So I can tell a story right now and I will do a mind movie for you. But then objectives is stakes. Is it life or death? Is it richness or poor? You know, like what is it involved? We've got to have stakes for it to be a story. If we don't have stakes, it's probably just an anecdote. And those are fine. Those can just be quick little moments that you had, but it's not like transformative. You know, a story should have transformation. And then the where is when the storyteller is explaining where they are in, what room are they in? Are they inside? Are they outside? What's it look like? Um, what's the, what's the vibe of the place? Uh, where are they in life? You know, how old were you when this story takes place? Sometimes people say, yeah, when I was a little kid, I used to run these lemonade stands. Well, right there, I'm already struggling. I'm like, were you six? Were you 10? Were you 15? Like, where were you? Cause I can't see you. So you want to know where you are in life. And then where are you kind of in your mental or spiritual state? You know, are you, are you up? Are you innocent? Are you terrified? Are you depressed? You know, what's going on with you? And when you have all those elements, which is covering crow, you now are setting up that mind movie really nicely for your audience. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to impro one, one story with this crow principles mm -hmm. and uh, demonstrate how it actually works? Okay. And, and when you do the characters or, or any part of it, you could mention like, okay, here I'm introducing the characters just for the audience. Um, you mean breakthrough? Well, let me do it. And then we can like, yeah. we can, we can, we can dissect it after that for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I do want to, I do want to speak to the power of dialogue. So dialogue will, whenever you can do dialogue, you actually take a flat story and absolutely give it a new dimension. So watch mm -hmm. for that. So I'll tell a story. This is a true, uh, they're always a true story. Um, and let me know what you could see or hear. Okay. So I am in this very swanky hotel room and there's about 200 of Seattle's finest angel investors. And we are there grabbing our box lunches and we're saying, Hey, Bob, Hey, Susie, it's good to see you. Blah, blah, blah. And we've got our brochures and we now know that the next big idea could be walking into the room today. And if they walk in and they blow us away, there's money in their accounts to be had. So there are going to be 10 presenters who have invested $20,000 to go and tour these four cities in the Northwest. And when they tour them, they get, they get 10 minutes to show their presentation and then they get removed for the room 
and these investors start poking at their their idea and then they get brought back into the room and asked grilling questions. And if they pass, they can see money coming towards them. But if they don't see the money, they will get feedback. They will get data. They will find out what is missing in their story that's not reaping the results that they have. So really, if you look at it like that, it's it's a win-win no matter what. Well, I turn to see this one speaker and he's in the back and he's huge. He's like the size of Kodiak bear. And he's got this silver jacket on and it's got this little speaker badge. And I look him up and I could see that he's actually solving ovarian cancer. That you could, you could see all the data in this, in this brochure. And I'm like, wow. So I walk up to him and I'm like, hi, you know, good luck with your presentation today. And he's like, oh, thanks. I'm like, yeah, you'll, you'll be great. He goes, what do you do? I go, well, I'm a public speaking coach. He goes, oh God, you're going to hate what I'm going to do. And then he just excuses himself and leaves. I mean, it was like, yeah, off he went. Well, 10 minutes later, he's getting up there on stage. And you could tell that this was the last thing that he wanted to do. He, he was happy in the lab looking at Petri dishes and solving complex problems. He did not want to be a CEO really and have to go ask for money. But sometimes that happens. Sometimes the genius becomes the founder and the founder has to go and do these things. A lot. It happens a lot. So he gets up there, they introduce him, he introduces himself, and then he immediately flashes onto the screen this giant rat. And it has a tumor on its leg like the size of a baby's head. And it's like, no, I mean, like no one's happy. Like the room starts to stir. You could see people pushing their lunches away. And on this graph, or on this picture, he has reversed out graphs with like percentiles and, and can't read it. You don't know what you're reading and he's talking and no one knows what he's saying and he's all science. And I just thought that is such a swing and a miss because why does he get up every day to do this work? Like who has crossed his path that made him go, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change this. I'm going to help women not have this. Was it his mom? Was it his relative? Was it a friend? Or was he just a doctor and he was, he was sad seeing these women. So another approach could have been where he would walk up and just say, like, just show a picture of a woman and just say, this is Sarah. She's a 42 year old soccer mom and she's on the phone with her doctor and he's saying, Sarah, we have discovered that you have a type two ovarian cancer. What? Yeah. And you are going to have to now uh, come into the office because we're going to have to get your meds straightened up and you're going to be taking those a lot. I am. Yeah. And we're going to have to explore radiation or chemo. Oh my God. She looks over at the pine or the Christmas tree and all she can think of is, will I see that next year? But at XYZ Pharma, we're changing those things. We are now reducing the tumors in ovarian cancer at a rate that's never been seen before. And then he could show us a chart. Hopefully still not that rat because <laughs> that was really repelling. But that's what I'm talking about is bringing a story in before he shows the chart, which I call putting heart in the chart. So mm-hmm. could you see that story? Oh, certainly. That was like a mind movie. What did you see? Well, I, I saw the emotions of the people, how they look like. I, you took me to that situation, actually, instead of describing it. Uh, that's how I felt the difference was. And there's just little things that do that. That's what's so fun about it. It's so like, so I said, and we're all mulling around, grabbing our lunches. Hey, Susie. Hi, Bob. You know, like that's all I had to do to create a crowd in your head. And then I look over mm-hmm. and I see this guy, the size of a Kodiak bear, you know? And so I'm using a metaphor so that I, some people might see a bear in a suit, you know, for a second. And then it, and he's wearing a silver jacket and he's got a speaker button on. I'm layering in for what I want you to look at in your imagination. Then I walk up to him. I'm like, hi. And I'm doing a friendly voice, right? And then he's like, huh, what? Ooh. You know, and so you could hear his tension. So all of that was using sights and sounds and smells. Um, I didn't use, oh, oh, smells. Yes, I did. So when she turns, when Sarah turns her head to look at the Christmas tree, I've had many people say, I smelled pine when you did that. One guy told me, mm. I saw pine needles on the floor. And one person said, so did I. And they, they hurt my feet. Like people will get lost and they don't even know what you're doing, but they're just 
mesmerized by what you're doing. And now it's emotional. And we're, we're fighting for Sarah. And now we're going to fight for Dr. Data over here because he's, he's winning us, right? And there's a balance. There's a balance of the story to the data. And the more he gets into it, he might, in the presentation, pick up speed on the data. But I'd still be weaving in stories, maybe bring Sarah back in, you know, later in, in the story, because your deck, your presentation deck should be also a story in itself. So we should talk a little bit about that too. What do you mean by that? Well, when I look at a presenter, I see the storyteller. It's the same thing to me. And mm -hmm. most, most present presentations fall apart at the slides. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know who it was. I'd like to find him or her who said, put everything you've ever learned on your journey for this company into one slide <laughs> and make lots of sentences, have graphs, have pictures, you know, like a slide should have like four things on it and that's it. That's it. And it should be very simple because people are forgetting that your oratory presentation has a huge advantage. It has you. It has you and your voice and your tonalities to, to weave in the stories while someone's looking at a slide just enough to process what you're saying. So the slide should be supporting you, not upstaging you. Because as soon as you put that slide up there and it's just hunkered down with the kitchen sink, you've basically said to your audience, please stop listening to me actively and try to read my crappy slide. And <laughs> The audience is wandering around. They don't know what to look at. They don't know why they're looking at it. They're trying to outread you because, oh, and then you start reading the slide to them. It's, it's not captivating that way and can be very frustrating to the audience. And so we want to be very careful because when you lose your audience in storytelling, it's not like a book. It's not like, you know how sometimes when you read a book, you might start to drift off and you're still reading and then you go, Oh, I missed that. I got to go back. You can reread it in storytelling. If you do something that takes someone out, and I call this the wonder wander effect. If you do something and you say an acronym, for instance, or you say something you assume everyone else knows it because you've got the power of that knowledge and they don't know what you're talking about, you are going to make them wonder. They're going to be like, what? what was that word? I didn't know what that word was. It's really big. I don't know. Does everyone in this room know what that word means except for me? And now I'm wandering away from listening to you because you, you, you knocked the train off the tracks for me. I'm, I'm like over here. And now you're still talking. You're giving your presentation unaware that I am totally lost now. Not just me, but a lot of people. And now we have to like run <laughs> next to the train to try and catch up with you. And you've just lost the potency of your talk because you weren't cognizant of some of the words and the graphs and the images that you're using that could confuse people. And I see that a lot. So some of them, a lot of my work is actually looking at the presentation with the speaker. I want to see their slides to see, like, are you keeping the train on the tracks or are you taking it off? And I give tons of examples of this in the book, to be honest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I understand. I'd like to go back to this crow uh, mm -hmm. method of yours a little bit. Could you could you explain to me who were the characters in the in your story and how, how did you okay. use this method while you were well, telling the story? Who were the characters? Well, there was me. There was Dr. Data. Mm -hmm. There was, um, I'm sorry, you froze. I'm here. Okay, great. Okay. So there was, uh, there was me. There was obviously Dr. Data. There is the crowd, right? And there's Sarah. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, but there's even some smaller characters. She's a soccer mom. I said that. Now I didn't say how many kids. Sometimes I have, sometimes I haven't, but that doesn't matter. So you've got like these little, these little quiet characters that I'm creating because I've said she's a soccer mom. And if I say soccer mom, a lot of people are going to relate to that, right? Like I'm a soccer mom. My sister's a soccer mom. You know, like we got to, we got to relate it. So those, those are, those are key characters. The Kodiak bear for a second is a character that came in. Yeah. The rat was I a see, character. I see. The rat was a character. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the R stands for relationships, right? That's the relationships, right. So how were you using, using relationships I as your advantage? I showed the relationships. Well, you saw the relationships between me and Dr. Data. I, he, he didn't, he didn't want to like me. He didn't want to know me. So that was, I was showing the relationship when I went, Oh God, you're going to hate what I do. Oh, and then he leaves. Bing. That was a relationship. Um, the relationship between on the phone between Sarah and the doctor was also the relationship. I was very like, very, you know, okay, this is what's going to happen. Uh huh. And I wanted you to hear her listening to him with respect and, and interest, right? It's 
this is a life or death story in, in this one. So I was showing the relationship of authority with someone who has to listen. Okay. And then, um, she even had a relationship with the Christmas tree because it's, it was a heartwarming time, right? Like, will I even see that tree next year? That line right there mm-hmm. can rip people's hearts out because it's like, when I, I've had people tell me that when I say the Christmas tree, they see children underneath the tree. They hear news or, you know, paper being unwrapped and whatnot. And even though you might not celebrate Christmas, everyone's seen a Christmas tree. Everyone knows what happens out under a Christmas tree, you know? And so mm-hmm. you, some of your choices, you want to make sure that you're being inclusive. But for that, for that part of that story, a Christmas tree has reached a lot of people in their lives. And so it's, it was, it was a character in itself. I see. And what did the O and W stand for in this method? O is for objective. So what's the point of the story? Why are you telling this story and what are the stakes involved? So Sarah's is pretty clear. It's life and death, right? It's life and death. Got it. Yeah. And the where, (laughs) the where is mental state or where is, um, she's 42 years old. So I said, Sarah is a 42 year old soccer mom. And so I'm telling Mm -hmm. her, I'm putting her in her forties because Everyone kind of knows, like most adults, like if you've, if you've read, lived five or six decades, everyone can remember their forties. If you're in your thirties, you kind of know what the forties are going to be. It's going to be busier than what you're doing right now. So forties are a very important life stage. And so I set her up like that. So where was she? And she was very serious. And then she got very scared. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to ask you next, uh, what, what books would you recommend? For somebody to read or, or a book, if there's one book that you would recommend that you... Other than the Storyteller's Mind movie that's coming on January, that's my book. <laughs> uh-huh. But that would be one of the books. But I always recommend uh, Matthew Dix. Uh, he has a book called Story Worthy. Um, I've studied under Matthew. It's, it's an amazing book. It's really designed more for personal storytelling. Um, but that's okay. Because again, that's how I started realizing that I can do this on stage really well. I can take this to the boardroom. And so um, those are really, really good books. There's some p- funny books. Uh, there's a uh, Margot Lightman and it's What's Your Story? That's another book. Um, or Long Story Short is another one that's fun. There is another book called Stories That Stick by Kendra Hall. And this one you would probably enjoy. She does a lot of brand stories in that particular book. Um, I'm doing, so my difference would be is I'm trying to bring in more personal stories for the leader to share and have in their own personal story library. So that's how my book will be different. It'll be about, tell us a time when you knew you were going to be on this path, but you were only a child. Or tell us a time when you didn't think the company could do it, but somehow your team pulled it off. You know, so I'm trying to give real work prompts for people so that they can start to build up their their business story to, story library. Got it. Uh, the last question, what I would like to ask from you today is, uh, is about the future. Since mm-hmm. as, as impact, impact business owners or uh, people who work for impact, in some way, uh, we all want a better future to happen for, for everybody. Uh, and things look very grim for a lot of people. And I'd like to paint a story, a picture of, uh, of a positive future. So uh, h- how would you see a positive future? Let's say everything has gone your way. It's 70 years in the future. It's 2092 mm-hmm. and it's a Melissa utopia outside. <laughs> if you would look from the window, that's there. It's there now. Uh, it's not a fantasy. It's just there. Mm-hmm. How, how do you describe the world? How would it look like? Technology, humankind, society? Mm-hmm. I see the world being, um, in much better place than we are right now because I get the opportunity to see the new futurists, the new founders coming forward. And I see their ideas flourishing with ways to make the world more beautiful, to be more sustainable, to be more inclusive and, and have diversity and celebrate it and equity and celebrate it, inclusion and really do it. Um, and that comes in the ways that people will communicate with each other. So. The, the more connected we are, the more, I think, love we actually start to find and respect we start to appreciate more. And storytelling can absolutely do that. And so I see the world, you know, like 
they, you know, picture, you know, uh, they, they have like salads growing from the, from the, from the walls and, and people are eating cleaner and we're not as, um, uh, run down by, you know, chemical sprays. We figured out how to do things more organically and we're in it together. And we're in it together mm-hmm. because we're sharing and we're connecting. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a really bright future. I just, I watch these young entrepreneurs. I, I'm listening to these students coming fresh out of the colleges and the universities and they're blowing me away the way they're thinking and they're thinking this way. And I say more power to them. So I'm going to help them find their story as fast as possible so that we can get to that place for sure. Oh, that's great. That sounds like, like a future I want to be in. Um, That's it for today, I think. Thank you so much, Melissa, uh, you. about your input in this world and, and uh, the stories that you tell and, and everything. How, how can somebody work with you if they, if they want to be able to tell stories? Yeah. How can I contact you? Well, if they want to work privately, you know, they can go to storytellwithmelissa.com and it's spelled out W-I-T-H. So it's storytellwithmelissa.com and they can just tell me a little bit about themselves and our team will look at it and we can we can have a complimentary call and just find out what you're doing. Because a lot of people... They want to also like, I want to, I want to do a TED talk. I, I want to, I want to write my own signature talk. How do I do that? We do that too. So we help people create, we teach them their story, the core story course. And then we can, we can go explore like how far they want to take this so we can create um, signature talks for them. But if you're a corporation, you know, I would recommend reaching out to us so we could look at like, how much do you want storytelling to be infused? Who would you have in a mastermind in your group that would help create the story library? Um, and, and so that's, that's a few ways. So you can go to storyfruition.com, storyfruition.com or storytellwithmelissa.com and it will take you um, to a landing page and we'll get back in touch with you. Okay, got it. Thank you, Melissa. And it was a pleasure as always. Yes. Until next time. All right. Bye. Bye.